role of cover crops and grassland restoration. I'm not going to recap everything we've already done, but for those of you that are that didn't participate in the first session or haven't had a chance to see, there's a, a put. We, we do have an SDSU video that highlights some of the SDSU sites in particular. I shared that link a while back, um, and then we also did the first of this series about a month ago, and that focused primarily on those SDSU plots. Um, it's unfortunate because there's so many people on it's kind of a one way conversation, but I hope to kind of get through this and do my best to answer any questions. I, I just want to preface this as like nobody involved in this, I, I think, considers themselves a cover cropping and restoration expert. And there was a lot of questions that came in last time is like, well, why didn't you do this or why didn't you do that? And, you know, really, this was just a developed uh, concept idea. And I think all of those why didn't you or why did you questions really are exactly why we're doing the webinar is say like, yeah, there's there's a lot to be learned yet on this. I, we only really are scratching the surface. And I would just say that probably what we learned through these pilots uh, does call for the the need for some more replicated research um, and some more real tighter trials. So there was a lot of input last time of people that had experimented with different things or had different experiences with different types of plants even uh, that that impacted restorations and so I don't the all I guess I got to say to that is I think we got a lot of opportunity to just continue to play around and see if we can't um, find additional niches and diff additional opportunities so anyway what we're going to talk about today so last time, like I said, we talked about the SDSU Northeast Reachford Farm trial plots. We had four other uh, loosely organized, well, related projects. Um, the Carolyn X site, the Game Fishing Park site at Redland, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service site down at Madison, and then kind of a personal site that myself and some neighbor and a neighbor are doing. That one we're going to skip today. I just didn't get a chance to develop that presentation fully for what we're doing at home so we're just going to talk about the other three today and then I'll kind of recap with, with the one at home so again if you had if you didn't join us last time the objectives here were just to try to test some of the USDA guidelines for grassland restoration some of that in relation to drilling versus broadcasting timing etc um, but we really wanted to figure out a way to help reduce the impact of agricultural chemical carryover again there was a lot of um, there's been a lot of discussion on whether chemical carryover is impacting these restorations, whether they're CRP or other. Uh, there's a sideline there just generally improving soil health through uh, addition of organic matter, et cetera, with uh, crop cover crop residue and then education. So what we really thought we were going to try to do is these very pilot studies or if you want to even call them that is just try to use one or two years of inexpensive uh, common cover crops prior to planting those native mixes see if we couldn't um, help mellow the the soil out with any addition any residual chemicals etc um, the team of people that's been working on this when i started putting it together is quite extensive and i'm very grateful to everybody that's had a hand in all of these um, trials I'm not going to go through all these names, but the names of those pictured is just a small representative, kind of that core group. But there's been a lot of other people. Um, I do have to, as far as the Carolyn X site, Kyle Monteith, uh, formerly from NRCS out of Clark, um, was very instrumental in getting that project off the ground. Um, as what, and then you can see the the the, the list of names. Um, and I probably even missed some. Um, on this list, but excellent support from all agencies and staffers from across across many organizations. Uh, so how this kind of develops is oftentimes we just meet in the field and we're just kicking kicking the dirt, asking questions and uh, we do some follow up. This is a follow up from the SDSU plot. So these are these follow up days. I just want to put out there when we have them. I think we have a even better connectivity now. Um, so just take advantage of those invitations if you can to come and see these sites. Hopefully we'll do that a couple more times this summer and uh, you can you can walk around and touch and feel these sites. Um, so we'll start with the now with the Redland one, which is a kind of a paired site to the SDSU site. Um, I want to make sure uh, Jessica, you're kind of monitoring for us. So 
questions. Um, the way this is set up on my end, it's kind of hard to monitor the chat and give the presentation and stuff. So uh, I'm really, I want this to be pretty informal. So there's a question that someone wants to chime in with or bump in with, that's totally fine. Um, or you can just save that for the end and we'll have that discussion. So I just wanted to put that out there. Yep, I'll monitor but, for, you, for you, Pete. What's that, Jessica? I said I'll monitor for you, Pete. I appreciate that. I just realized my headset was not plugged in. Okay. Um, so the Redland site is located uh, just on the east side of Long Lake, north of Henry, South Dakota, uh, south of um, Wallace, if you're familiar with that area. So it's just a small site as part of the larger, um, the larger uh, Redland WPA. Old agricultural field cropped annually for 50 plus years, they think. Um, so again, we wanted to do some till versus no till comparison using cover crops as a seabed prep, uh, in implementing burning and mowing as kind of follow up rest, uh, follow up management techniques, very similar to the SDSU sites. Um, this is just generally the shape of the site. It's about 50 some acres. Uh, this is the, what we call the north site. We did do, you know, the kind of ran it through the soils testing and stuff. Everything's pretty consistent there. Um, this slide kind of is not very good, but anyway, we took a look at that. There's no no drastic um, differences in soil types or soil or topography or anything like that. Uh, anything unusual for this area. Um, so it's a series of till versus no till and then different planting techniques and different management. Again, non replicated plots. Um, so we're just looking for trends and patterns and just learning plots. Um, so four of the plots were tilled in the fall of 2017. That was kind of the start. Again, this was old. This was coming out of bean stubble or be soybeans. So we were, it was bean stubble. And then that same fall, two of the of the square plots were planted into a, a grassland mix. This was kind of an off the shelf mix, supplemented with some of the GF and P hand harvest stuff. That west 13 acres was simply just planted in the fall of 2017 uh, with the grassland mix and that that particular triangle is kind of like what we might call open management like best management practices whatever they want to do uh, to to continue or to get that seeds that that is that seeding established uh, what's in front of you now is uh, simply the um, general mix that they put in uh, 38 species grassland mix I'm not going to go through all of those, but Game Fish and Parks does a really good job of mixing uh, their natives. So there's a lot of, a lot of early spring forbs, later forbs, uh, cool and warm season grasses. That was again drilled in the fall of 2017, kind of a dry fall at that point. And then uh, in the spring of 2017, the other two northern plots were then drilled uh, with the same mix. So across the north, uh, that in that first, what we might call first round of planting was all just straight uh, native uh, seed mix. Okay, and that was the test. That was the kind of the comparison of till versus no till. Across the southern tier is where we used um, all the cover cropping. So. Again, those were those were recover crops established on both tilled and, and no till um, drilled. And this was the mix of the cover crops. Nothing grandiose, nine, uh, 11 species mix. Um, and you can see there's clovers, safflowers, uh, hemp. So they kind of covered the gamut just like we did at SDSU. Um, in the fall of 2018, two of those cover plots were then uh, tilled. And this would be prior to establishment and drilling of the fall grass seeding in the fall of 2018. So those grasses were seeded into the cover crop residue or the tillage in the fall of 2018. Um, the progression of, of the uh, growth of those the native grass mix on the site again that that western um, triangle was planted in fall 2017 and by june 6 of 2018 we had some pretty good establishment we could roll that out and by october of 2018 this is what it looked like pretty typical first year restoration a lot of a lot of good natives in there but some weedy pressure as well 
Um, and then we got more creative. So Owen McElroy, who's in, and Brett Blank were the managers of this site. So then on the uh, that Southwest tier here again, we had it's kind of the same situation as SDSU. We started playing around with more things, you know, again, non replicated. So here we had uh, a um, 2019 spring, just grass mix on the north tier of those and then a grass cover a grass mix cover crop mix on in south and on what's called what's in purple so again those were kind of like subplot trials um <clears throat> the uh this is our management map this is what owen put together green means it had been mowed red had some burning it uses burning and then gold is open management that's that western side so that's kind of what guides us through our management scenario so you can see these there's a bunch of stacked things on these plots uh, what we saw on the ground though you know i'm just going to walk you through this real quickly where we planted in the fall of 2017 where there was no till no burn this is just the native mix again by um in june of 18 we started to row it out uh it was burned in spring of 2019 and then going across by july of 2019 post burn pretty decent uh, establishment of forbes the uh fall planting and I, I do realize i'm sure you're out there listening to this there's a lot going on here we're just kind of trying to set the stage so um there's kind of a lot to get through so don't get hung up if you do or don't remember all of this stuff i think it's just going to kind of come out in discussion later but i just kind of want to set the stage of all of what was going on on these plots so no till no burn on the uh fall on, on a, some of the falls planting subplots here again with just the native mix no cover crops nothing really unusual or surprising here um, <clears throat> this is not going to be all that helpful to that so again so again all of the all of the southern tier plots did have a cover crop history and this is where we get into some of the what we started to see on those plots where we use cover crops again till versus no till really good establishment of covers in year one that is uh very much that should say established yeah so that was those were 2018 pictures very much like what we had at sdsu plots really good healthy covers and then uh by year two uh, what came back in those covers um, in the in that residual after winter, we had pretty heavy thistle infestation. Now again, not pointing at the covers as the source of the thistles, but the trend that we saw on the land management side of it was again really really very consistent with what we saw at SDSU. Great year of covers, and all of a sudden you got this bed of thistles that shows up the next year in the spring. Um, we can talk about at the end what that why that might be occurring. Um, I think I already covered this one. I'm sorry. Um, and the southern and the southern plots, um, it was just a little small area that they did down south, where they did some uh, another old field kind of had been idled. Uh, they tilled part of it, and then they just did some um, food plot planting and then it got ultimately followed up by uh, native mix and I just wanted to show you this because this was interesting you know when we're talking about those interim years um, this is mustard that came up and I don't know if you can hear the this but you can see the bees in here um, pretty amazing uh, pollinator stand just for that interim year so we have to make sure I think we all know that like weediness is okay it really isn't a big deal. It's just a transition time and something's always going to find some use of that. But this would make a, a bee person extremely happy for um, one season. So, you know, do you go in and mow this down? You know, no. What would be the point of that if it's not going to impact our, ultimately our stand? And this is that south stand in the June of 2019. You can see that the the planting the natives are coming the grasses of course you know so that interim year of weediness is just transition years and i think sometimes we get a little hung up on on weeds whereas at sdsu we had to to mow um just because of some of the aesthetics and location this is well off the beaten path no reason to burn the fuel the time or the energy to mow those uh mustard plants 
and by fall of 2019 pretty nice stand of cover um in that site okay. that is the background on the redland site um unless there's any questions right now i'm going to move into the other sites as well um but i will pause now and take if there's questions about the redland site or the management or that or the the infestation of thistles there not seeing any questions in the chat okay okay we'll keep uh we'll keep moving and we'll kind of lay the groundwork here so now i'm going to bounce down to the Fish and Wildlife Service site at the Hart Waterfowl Production Area down by Madison, managed by Kyle Kelsey. Uh, I'm sure many of you know Kyle. What this site is, is kind of, a, again, it's like a one-off, super interesting. And th these are what Kyle calls the Fish and Wildlife Service's um, uh, corn, corn blue stem stands. Basically, these are old restoration sites that fish and wildlife picked up where they restored old crop ground and they were pretty much dominated by warm season grasses you know and then pretty much ultimately turn turn into monocultural big blue stem stands and for their purposes yeah, there's cover there but the, it, they offer no diversity and kyle's really been trying to figure out how to get some diversity into these stands and this is just one of the things that he was experimenting with so what they what kyle did here is uh, the timeline was that in it, he he i'm going to go back a map see all if you can see my cursor and i don't know if you can but there's all these strips within the bound the green boundary of the wpa so i hope you can see that but if you can't it'll become more clear as i go through this anyway they uh so they hate off strips um and then they treated those strips in the fall and the spring with glyphosate and basically killed that blue stem off as much as they could um now again this stuff had been this is old grassland stand you know planted stands i think a couple decades in blue stem at least so just to kind of set that background um and then in the summer 2021 he uh drilled cover crops into those dead strips to try to get some diversity going with the idea then of creating a receptive seed bed for a native prairie mix to be planted then in the fall of 2021 and so i want to point out something very different um s somewhat different here is that kyle kept his you know he didn't he planted later his cover crops went in when farmers normally plant a similar cover crop mix, which is a three species like uh, brassica mix that he, I'll, and I'll show you that mix here in a second. But timing was summer, midsummer, whereas ours was in the spring. And then he followed up immediately in the fall with that uh, um, that native mix. So the difference is his timeline's a lot shorter, and he didn't allow. Uh, an incubation period under a big stand of cover crops like what we did. His was very low diversity cover crops, very open, and this is exactly what he what he had that summer. So the native Forb mix that he went into is on your screen right now. Again, about a 20 or so species native mix that was planted into those covers. Um, that's just that same list blown up. The cover crop themselves was a three way mix out of Millbourne, radish, rapeseed, and purple top turnip. Um, so, all in that same general category of plants. I find this really interesting. So, then what Kyle did was uh, he used cover crops on every other strip. He kind of had three units west, central, and east, and every one was a little bit of its own trial. So, this one was cover crops using the strips and then he drilled the native mix into every strip so he had a comparison side by side comparison on the west unit and the middle unit he didn't use any cover crops and then he put his native seed forb mix into every strip and on the east um he tilled everything he so the strips were mowed off tilled and then and then sprayed whereas the other ones were no till and he put covers in every one of those strips and he used and then he followed up with the natives so three little kind of mini trials and his results were kind of interesting um 
generally speaking, anywhere where he used cover crops in the in the uh, interim, whether it was tilled or untilled, had very poor establishment of his native species. Um, the middle unit where he used no cover crops had the best success. And the east unit where he did do some of that pre-tillage, again, now we're not blaming cover crops for, the, you know, this is just how what happened, right? So he, he used tillage and covers and he had a pretty intensive thistle infestation. Maybe not surprising, but that had been grassland for, like I said, you know, planted grass for decades. And so again, that thistle obviously was, was there. He probably woke it up with the tillage. Um, but regardless, it was pretty poor results. Um, anywhere, even with the untilled covers was poor results. So on that East unit, he, uh, they reworked it in the fall of 2022. And then this spring here in April, they rebroadcast a, a, a native seed mix into those strips. So results of that are, are pending. Take home from Kyle on this, you know, I'm reiterating what he told me. He was unimpressed with the use of the cover crops based on his trials, whether it was tilled or no tilled, they just did not get good native grassland establishment. And again, his cover crops was a straight up brassica mix. You know, I don't think we have enough knowledge to know what the drivers of that, of those results are, but those are the results. Um, so again, I'm gonna pause. And if there's any questions there, I will, entertain them and try to answer them the best I can on, on Kyle's trials. You do have a question in the, in the chat, Pete, so I'll read it for you. Uh, doesn't seem like glyphosate would have an effect on killing big blue stem if applied in the fall or spring, since the big blue was probably dormant. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I guess it's a good question. I think though the results speak for themselves. If you look at their, I'm going to go back through, look at their plots. Uh, they obviously had a very dramatic impact. Um, this is on their no-till plot. They, they, they remember they hated off. So um, I think when we say fall and spring, I think we would have to assume, you know, Kyle really knows what he's doing. I don't think Kyle's going to apply a glyphosate to a, a dormant stand. So I, I think we have to give him the benefit of the doubt on that, that whatever that timing was, it was the plants would have been green and receptive to the glyphosate. Um, so that's a good question, but I, I, I would assume that very much, I would assume that that's actually um, applied to green and growing vegetation. Good question, though. Anything like else? That's Jess? it for now, Pete. OK, so let's move to now. This is a cool project, um, and some of you are familiar with this. This is the Carolyn. I'm going to move us to the Carolyn X site. Um, this one, this is going to take us a little longer to get through because there's a lot going on here, but it's really an interesting site. Uh, it's a multi-partner site um, that it's on private land. And this is basically the background here is that initial site assessment was no, Carolyn came into my office and she was a persistent, wonderful young lady. And uh, she really wanted to do something good with her land out at, uh, by uh, Warner Lake, north, again, north of um, Henry, south of Wallace on the, on the uh, west side of um, Warner, I'm sorry. Yeah, kind of the west side of Warner Lake. Um, very much in overgrazed, uh go back pasture situation meaning it had been tilled and cropped way in the past and then probably for the last many decades she doesn't even really know for sure and i tried to piece together the history i can all i can say is many decades probably since the 60s this thing had been vegetated with uh invasive grasses that probably just revegetated on their own um, whether they did an active planting, I really don't know. It's really hard to, to tell. But this is the this is basically what this land looked like prior to initiation of this project, year round, heavily grazed. Uh, you couldn't hide a marble on most of these pastures, um, and the cattle were you know the cattle condition. You can see. I don't think I have to go too far into that explanation, but it it was it was pretty dismal. Um, 
I ran it through our native grass analysis with my team and what's in bright green. So the the property boundary is about 190 acres. You can see the square quarter section that's kind of outlined and then there's a leg going off to the east. And that generally that leg was thought to be at least at least, you know, functionally untilled native. Um, the rest of the green patches arguably untilled and, and we're our, our wetlands more or less within that that boundary so very little of it was was unmanipulated in the past we then applied nrcs lidar uh to once we had that uh, access to that to verify you and this you can really see now what the land looks like you can see the old gravel pits there's several of them uh, scattered throughout so very manipulated landscape uh, up in the northwest corner, you can kind of see there's a triangle of native. That's about a four or five acre area of native. But what's interesting is across the top in the pink, in the pink hand drawn polygon. If you've never seen lidar before, look at the smoothness of that land versus the rest of the striations across all the land. That's what lidar is really doing for us in this assessment. So I looked at that and I'm like, hey, I think that's a miss. I actually think that's native and um, and we it got miscategorized and all of the plant, all of the vegetation indicators are such that 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 was probably never tilled up there. It's very hilly topographically. It would not have been a good area to, for tillage, but that's what that LIDAR really allows us to look a little deeper into the land. Ultimately, what we decided on is about a 45 acre restoration region that would be the project area, this multi partner project area. I mean, that's outlined in pink on this one. This is kind of what the farm looks like uh, from an aerial view looking from the east looking west. So it's a it's a beautiful wildlife area. It's got fish and wildlife service. Um, game fishing parks. Um, neighboring properties as well, so it's it's well suited. So once we initiated this project, this multi-partner project, NRCS came in with so dynamic soil testing um, or the dynamic soil properties project. Uh, Kerry Workmeister uh, was the one that led that charge. Um, and so they picked four areas um, that were two of them native soils and two of them non-native soils. So on the map that you see right now, the Northwest, so they call, this was the name of these things. It wasn't, uh, the driver wasn't the burn. The driver was whether it was native or not. And the burns were some of the actions that Kerry wanted us to, that, that we wanted to test. So the Northwest native and the native burn are both uh, as indicated native, native soils. The cover crop and the non-native burn are previously manipulated soils farmed, you know, way in the past or at least, you know, probably four or five decades ago and have since reverted into go back pasture. Now, I look a little deeper in this and I see that I think we also missed the boat on one thing. Um, and I want you to look at the the lower right corner, that non, um, I'm sorry, the Southeast native burn site. If you look into that, it looks to me like that might have actually been tilled in the past. So that's, there's still a question mark on that one. Um, Kyle Monteith, Jay Herman were very involved in, in the um, Dynamic Soils Properties Project as well and helping us do our soils assessment. We had a couple of really good days out there in 2020, just kind of laying the background groundwork on this site. The recovery of that Northwest burn area, you know, I've, I've said it many times, fires really to our truth tellers for our native, whether we've got native soils that we're working with or not. And we there wasn't a stitch of native grass that showed up in this thing until we burned it. And then we actually had the blue stems and the switch grasses and things like that show up, not in great abundance, but it does indicate to me that it is native. I'm not gonna try to terp, interpret the dy dynamic soil properties results here because they're so early on. So these were our baseline um, results on the first go around of testing. I think it's interesting to see the differences in the Northwest native burn, which is represented in blue. 
compared to the other three sites, and I don't, I'm not going to interpret it. I don't really know how to interpret it, but over time, I think we'll learn more. But I, I will say that it's different. Um, that it, the, it's always that that blue line is always going to be uh, at the extreme of one side or the other, or show a much different pattern. So here's our total nitrogen. Not so much there, I guess. Um, but if we look at now, here's our our pH. Is that significant? I don't know, but it's definitely separate from the rest of the um, the rest of the trials. I think I just think these are interesting results, and hopefully, maybe at the end we can have a discussion if someone's on that can help you know us interpret some of this a little bit more. Um, the EC, I don't even know what that stands for to be honest with you, but again, uh, a very a, a very different pattern or at least a uh yeah different pattern and again here's potassium again a different pattern with the native soils making me think based on this i would say that our native our the yellow line are what we call that native burn probably is not actually virgin sod i'm guessing that was tilled it just lumps itself with all the other tillage um across the board on these on these dynamic soils properties so i think this is kind of cool um, so again, I already I already called this out. I believe that's probably a tilled site on that southeast native. I think we got that wrong. Uh, as far as fungi, I'm just going to show this. I don't really again. I'm not going to interpret it much. But it, here's our fungi graph. The native burn um, in that case has higher active fungi. That's that site that I think had tillage in the past. I'm not sure if this is consistent or not. Um, on the total fungi, though, the, not, the, the, na the Northwest native burn, the site that we know is native sod, was highest. Does, is that significant or not? Don't know. Um, the non-native site, uh, you can see on, on active bacteria is the highest. Um, total bacteria, though, here are natives, our native burn is highest. So again, just, just some of these trends I think are interesting. I, I don't really know how to interpret them. But that was all paid for by NRCS, um, and that's much appreciated. So this, there's a lot of involvement of multiple partners on this particular project. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. So I already, I already showed you this is our grassland restoration area. So this is where we went into active grassland restoration. Uh, again, it was dominated by Kentucky bluegrass, smooth broom, go back pasture. A lot of goldenrod and and very few natives. A little bit of verbena in there, a little bit of uh, fringe sage, that type of thing. Some of those really tough native plants. Very poor breakdown of of um, you know other indicators. You know, very poor breakdown of manure. Probably more so having to do with those cattle were out there so late in the fall. A ton of lignin. I don't think it had much to do with chemistry because we did see some what I would call dung beetle activity. Um, not super prevalent, but you know when you're. I think those of us that understand cattle, when you're dropping uh, manure in November, yet it's not going to break down very well by the following spring. Um, the whole entire site was pre-treated with glyphosate on an overspray uh, prior to the initiation of the restoration to try to knock back that brome and bluegrass infestation. That was performed by a neighbor of Carolyn's uh, who we um, contracted to do that work. So again, glyphosate treatment. Um, and I'm just going to play just a little bit of this for you. Um, pretty good coverage. He did a good job. Uh, actively trying to stay, you know, at least give the wetlands a, a bit of buffer. So he did a fairly good job on all of this. So we were pretty happy with it. Um, you got a fairy ring there that's shaped in the number five. I think that was kind of cool. Um, so here and here's the result of that spray. So a very complete uh, application of glyphosate uh, across the site. Acres and here's an aerial image of the same prior to any planting. You can actually see that Mike Meester's out there with the drill. This is year one, but he you can see his tractor out there. But this is our 45 acre killed site. Uh, went in then uh, post post spraying with a pretty simple um, cover crop mix, and that's shown uh, in the pink on the right: oats, barley, sorghum, rapeseed, flowers, etc. So this is in 2020. 
Ducks Unlimited foot, footed the bill for all of our cover crop seed for this project. Um, Mike Meester, in the, when Mike was with the Conservation District at that time, did the planting, did an excellent job. Uh, I've never worked with anybody that was so good at running a drill. So Mike, if you're out there, uh, kudos to you. Anyway, uh, Capriva Angus was a partner on the project as well out of, out of Raymond and, and between the Capriva Angus and Conservation District um, helped helped us um, with the planting and, and a reduced price on the on the uh, bill for that. And then it was covered by Capriva Angus. Mike working his magic, making sure the drill is set. And this is kind of what we were drilling into um, after that initial glyphosate application. Not too rough, pretty good. I mean, Mike had to find a magic spot. I'm going to move on. Oh, that's just another another shot of the same thing, breaking up the, the cow pads with the drill. So pretty receptive seed bed. By July of that first year, uh, the covers were coming really well. That's Jim Capriva and uh, Carolyn Eck. That's our that's our site um, landowner. The reason that we had Capriva involved in this is that we were intending fully to uh, incorporate livestock grazing into this cover crop in the fall. Never happened due to a, a, a suite of different circumstances, but that was our intent, was that we were going to get livestock integration on this particular cover crop project. Uh, by July, again, the covers were coming pretty good in that first year. Some residual native plants also were woken up by that I think probably just by the actions we took, a little bit of spray to relieve some pressure. So here you got some scurf pea that's showing up on its own in the uh, in the cover crop area. Poor catch and it, it, the whole thing didn't catch well with co in the covers, but not too bad. Um, leafy spurge is a, a, an issue at the site and remain an issue even post spraying. I don't think that really surprises anybody that we didn't control spurge with glyphosate. But we did put a little bit of a hurt on it. Um, by and large, though, um, cover crops came pretty well over time. And by September, we had a pretty nice stand of covers, nice stand of, of uh, habitat. And so things were looking, you know, pretty, pretty good with what we knew at the time. Things were looking, you know, on par with what we expected. By November, we had basically excellent pheasant cover, and that was one of Carolyn's primary objectives is just some wildlife um, residuals. So this, it's all nothing here too surprising, but this project is a two year cover crop project. So then we came in um, the following year and replanted, or re-sprayed in, in 2021 again, early spring treatment of glyphosate, same drill trying to hit some of these uh this is wormwood and stuff things that were coming up in this restoration area anyway um kind of the same drill in 2021 and we missed spraying this little peninsula which basically just shot up with wormwood i'm just showing that so nothing at this site is is pristine necessarily you know there's some there's some ugly corners and some you know some some weed pressure for sure uh but again, then we had the conservation district um, re help us replant the covers in 2021, second year covers into that cover residue. We did try burning off that residue and it didn't work very well, so we just planted right into it. And then came the dryness of 2021. And this is Jay and, and uh, Kyle out there with me. Um, we're assessing the site in July 2021. And if you remember, that was dismal. Um, it was a, we had a pretty much a barren wasteland. What little bit did come up was uh, basically taken off by geese. And so by July, um, things were looking pretty rough. There's our geese. Uh, but by the end of July, we had caught just a little bit of rain and we start, things started to pop. And you can see some, you know, here we got some retibita, some um, verbena coming up in our cover crop. So there's these hangers on of natives that were actually in this in the site. And then our covers covers did start to come. End of July, uh, the, we hadn't really exploded from the rainfall yet, but we had received some rain right prior to our um, our field days out there. Um, as you can see, the covers are starting to grow here a little bit pretty, pretty late, but coming. 
I'm sorry about that. Here's the, you know, and then we started to see patchiness. Here's the patches of buckwheat. Uh, I think this is where the geese cleaned out all the other seeds and the buckwheat was, was what was left by August. And by sep late August and September where we had caught some rain, uh, here the sorghum really came on. So it wasn't a total bust that year for, for cover anyway with the cover crops, but it was quite different from year one. Um, by the fall, you know, where it did catch, that's one of our... Um, that's one of our beets or radishes, I guess. So, you know, not not a total bust going into the fall of 2022 or the fall of 2021. And then in the in that fall, we did a dormant seed and planting with Game Fish and Parks. And here we drilled directly into those. And so we had two years of covers, two years of spraying, and then we drilled directly into it in December. The soil was still very soft underneath this snow cover. So we took advantage of that and GF and P. Dormant seeding. Uh, we also tested all of our seed just to make sure that um, we weren't bringing in any any weeds into the site. And, unsurprisingly the seed test come back clean so we get into the fall end of 2022 then and we're into the management and i did mow uh a few times in 2022 pretty selectively we got a mower purchased um by the south dakota grassland coalition for the project uh to help us out just because it's so remote we couldn't really rent or our uh, mowers from anywhere and throughout the course of last year, we met on site a few times just to kind of assess. We had a lot of carryover of covers that came in. Um, and our native catch is questionable, I would say. Uh, we've had some really weird growing conditions, so we'll see how, how well our natives really do show up this year. That was kind of a whirlwind tour of that project. If you've been on that one, you, you know, I think you can kind of fill in the blanks, but I didn't want to take too much time here. I want to leave time for questions and answers. So that sets the stage. Um, two projects today kind of point as covers. The use of covers is maybe being a little bit disappointing um, for what we've seen with results. Whether we're blaming the covers for that or not is not really the issue. I think it could be the process. Um, but I will also say at the Carolyn Eck project, this last one that I ran you through, again, we did not see a dramatic catch of our natives uh, coming out of that year, the two years of using cover crops. Um, and with that, I'm going to, I'll again, open it up for discussion or um, questions or whatever we've got. Just a reminder, you can also use the raise hand icon if you want to ask a verbal question or you can type a question in the chat. Yep, and I, I can see the chat now. I can't see, I don't really, I imagine most cameras are off. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. You, you might have blown everyone's minds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's a lot. It's a lot to take in. And I know that it's it's very difficult to um, connect really hard lines between our observations. And, and again, I just want to fall back. They're pilot. They're pilot experiments. But what I, I I'll, I'll reiterate the cautionary tale that I, I kind of said on the first one. And it is just a caution. I just think we have to really be cognizant of how we're um, suggesting use of cover crops to producers in the restoration arena, because I don't think we know enough about it yet. I don't think we know enough about what, and again, I'll go back to some of what we talked about the first time. If we're using cover crops, like a full season cover crop, 
and we are not necessarily seeing the success in the establishment of natives. And again, every project that we've had has actually ended up kind of in the same place with huh, not that impressed with the establishment or natives. I'm not saying it's because of the cover crop. It could be. It could be. It could be that we have a leopathy. It could be that we have something else going on we don't understand. And again, we picked a handful of common covers and we assume that, hey, let's try this and see if they're a good surrogate for our native plants. Remember, most of our covers are non are they're non native, right? They're not even they don't even originate here. So there's that factor. And then there's the other factor of all the millions of plants on the earth. We picked this 15. Well, maybe we just got it wrong. Or maybe it's simply the process of allowing the other weedy bad nasties that are already in the soil or in the system. Maybe we gave them a green light to just sit there and wait in the wings no disturbance no anything for a year and and we got tricked i i don't know i you know, i think that none of us really know but i think that i think our collective experience points towards some of these things as you know needing a little bit more knowledge before we're probably out there suggesting to producers that this is a good idea now i'll also say that I do think that use of covers to mellow the soil, um, give that, you know, we got to grow, we got to grow something. And if we've got chemical history issues and stuff, I don't think this is a bad idea. But what might have to happen is that next step of tillage or glyphosate or something to terminate not only the covers, but maybe to terminate all other things that are growing in that seed bed so that when we do put the na the expensive native plants and we start fresh. Um, I really would love to hear from others if anybody wants to jump in. Um, I see that. Steve has his hand up and then there are some questions in the chat also. So Steve, go ahead. Yeah, Pete, uh, Steve Spawn with Fish and Wildlife. Hey Steve. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe you you might have said I think the Carolyn Eck site has been planted back to a native mix, right? Yeah, we drilled uh, native game fishing parks drilled the native mix in the fall of 2021 after the 2020 and 2021 cover cropping years. Correct. Okay. Have you seen much favorable result there? And, and what's the plan moving forward on that site just to try to allow the the native mix to take hold? Well, yeah. So um, again, we drilled it. It did a dormant season mix. Very dry year early in 2021. Um, and then we drilled in the fall of 2021. We had really adequate soil moisture coming in the spring of 2022. The seeds, the native seeds were in the ground. The cover crops were primarily, you know, there was a there was a few residual covers that there's always going to be when you let covers go full length, they're going to drop some seed and they're going to, you know, they're annuals. And so some of them are going to come back. But I'll tell you, Steve, I was very more or less disappointed by the catch of our natives last, you know, last growing season. I mowed when necessary to try to keep that weed pressure down, give those natives a chance to come through it's not it didn't look very good i'll be i'll be honest now this spring if there's enough fuel i am going to try to get a fire across that here um real shortly honestly but in fact i got to go assess the site today or tomorrow but i'm hoping they come they come in um they should but if they don't if they don't does that give us a red flag to say that hey again another failure in using cover crops um, uh, with native mix establishment. You know, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater on this thing, but here it would be another, just another notch in the belt of, hey, it, you know, another one that didn't work, right? <laughs> now we got five. <laughs> um, so I don't know. It'll be interesting. I'm, I'm hopeful that it, that patience will pay off on that deal. But if I could, before we go to the next question, if I could, the question on the table is, would we have been better off 
just stick into the kind of the try and true process of spraying that thing with glyphosate twice and just drilling the natives right into this and not dicking with the cover crops. And I, I don't know, you know. Yeah, thank you. You bet. Okay, and and I think you you kind of answered this question already because Val asked, "What are your alternatives if you don't see natives this year?" But it, it does sound like you're gonna you're gonna complete a burn uh, first of all, and then uh, kind of evaluate after that. Yeah, we'll continue to burn and mow. We're not gonna come in with livestock on this site until, unless or until we really get a good a good establishment of natives. It would be premature to actually come in with any livestock because we'd probably pull up our one and two year old plants. You know, cattle cattle are pretty hard on early restorations. Um, so, but I will go a little, one step further. So we've got a lot of multi-partner investment into this site, right? You know, um, game fishing parks with, uh, you know, private lands project and all that. So this is, this is a pretty expensive experiment ultimately. Um, now I got, I got to say, because this is mostly agency and stuff on our landowner has stepped up to the plate. So there's ease there, you know, done the easements and done the, the long-term contracts and stuff. So this, this is a, a bit of a playground for us to kind of learn and experiment for a long time. I'm not at all willing to write off the native stand establishment yet, but I think in two or three years, if we still don't see a good catch it, it, on any of these projects, it, it really might be an indicator. So that's why we keep calling for uh, replicated research. It's probably time, right? So Jessica, you can run how you want to do the questions. Yep. I see I'll, I'll read the questions and... since we're recording. I'll read the questions that way. Um, sure. I, I just think it records a little better that way. All right. So Ken asked, were the DSP sites the same or similar soil types? Yes. So the dynamic were. soil properties. Yep. The 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 team, um, the the DSP team handled all that and they made sure that we had consistency across the board of soil types. So the difference is the history. Uh, the management history, but soil types and stuff were very comparable. So okay, um, given these experiences, what do you think is the best way to establish natives, or what are your next steps in research? And I think you kind of touched on that also. I have, but I'll I'll just reiterate, like we're collectively all of us as agencies and as individuals, there's a long storied history of kind of what works and what doesn't work. And I think we all can kind of fall back on the knowns, you know, um, probably going into bean stubble generally seems to work pretty, you know, I would, I would argue bean stubble, no-till drilling, um, with some use of glyphosate in pre or post in that establishment. We all kind of know that those are tools that we can mix and match and, and really do quite well with establishment. And so we weren't trying to necessarily fix a problem. But we were trying to address in a new emerging problem that we see in failures, especially in CRP failures, or if we want to call them failures, is that we've got this chemical thing going on that nobody understands very well, this chemical residual. So we were trying to address that stage of the problem. And how do we help, you know, again, remember, you got to look at the big picture here. How do we help a producer? You know, man, if you tell someone you got to go dormant for a year and just keep it sprayed out, with nothing growing and no return that doesn't work either so this was kind of one of those steps in the process of figuring out what we're going to do in the future so um that's essentially what we were trying to solve and then comparing it to what we know as kind of existing best management practices and sometimes the answer we get is you know what it doesn't work and i think we can accept that as well so i you know we uh we um we're not feeling butthurt over this at all like it's just these are the results that we're seeing and maybe and there's a lot of learning that can come from it so yep and then we have a comment from sean just to comment the last year in aurora county a cover crop mix was planted into a native restoration project in late spring that was predominantly kentucky blue it had been burned and sprayed with roundup there were drought conditions and the cover crop never grew more than a few inches tall, uh, green and yellow foxtail ended up taking over and the native planting is supposed to happen this year. So I think it'd be good if Sean would keep keep us in the loop, you know, me and, and you, and we can get more information out too on, on how things work with that planting. Um, and then we'll go to, I believe Tance has his hand up. Yep. 
Well, it's it's not contrary at all. Just uh, just a perspective from my West River experience, and this includes even tame grass seedings with alfalfa. In that, uh, in a lower moisture regime, I've kind of come to the conclusion that we we need to encourage folks to continue with managing for noxious weeds, of course, but don't judge success or failure for three to five years in some instances. Um, you know we're seeing pretty preliminary data that isn't that encouraging from these project sites but i guess i would ask you pete um you know is is there a reason to continue to hold out hope and continue mowing like the carolyn x site and and see what happens when better conditions offer themselves yeah so excellent question tance um excellent question so if you had if, if those of you that didn't get a chance to hear my first part one of this what concerns me the most is that the sites at the sdsu plots and the gf and p game fish and parks plots where we used covers um for one or two years and then went into the natives those native plantings just are not coming out of that and some of them are now going into their fifth growing season and uh, I like Sean's comment, and it's not just thistles that it, it's it's uh, it's the foxtails, right? They take they can grab hold and really be really be an issue. Um, so I want to make sure that we reiterate, you know, you could almost call all of this. We could we could we could focus on the cover crops, or we could focus on the site prep. And I just want to say the combination of what we did in this did not result in what we were very hopeful would be like some the, the you know the new holy grail of restoration right like hey let's get some covers in let's amend the soil let's get some organic matter on and on and on just not seeing it yet uh will will the carolyn x site wake up um because we did have some glyphosate application there you know maybe this year it'll blow up and we've all seen that right i'm not at all writing off these native restorations we all know that when the time is right, the natives grow. But after four years on some of those plots, I'm like, oh man, this isn't this isn't really looking very good. And if care if the Carolyn X site follows that same pattern, and by 2026 we're having the same conversation, um, that's why I just don't think we should be jumping the gun and encouraging folks to use covers for the specific assumption that it's going to make your native restoration better. Now, I don't want to move away from covers for solving other problems like, like, you know, maybe chemical residue, maybe soil amendment. I think all of those are good, but I think we have to just, just understand that there may be still need for a management action to break the weed cycle between a cover and assuming that we can just plant our natives into that cover residue like we've been doing that just doesn't seem to be working out for us as well as we thought it would is, is that does that make sense tance like just caution you know it, it does and and i understand that we're dealing with already significantly manipulated landscapes in for the most part and, and so the challenges are are great and many and and you alluded to the fact of the complexity, you know, makes each site unique. Um, and we, the other thing I don't, I, I would like to just, you know, kind of set the the stage for, for a, like, again, the plants themselves, what do we really know? I mean, we, I, I would say we know nothing about the suite of these covers that we picked. Again, they're all individual plants. We lump them together and we say cover crops and we pretend they're like, they're one happy family, right? We have really no idea how those interact with each other. You know, they're not like a native plant community that we kind of understand the interactions of those plants and the interspecific competition and also the interspecific complementary complement complementing that they do with each other. We take 15 covers off the shelf and we were like, yeah, these are all good. Well, they are probably all good in, in the role that we've that they've been discovered in. But can we really assume that they're good for the natives plant community that follows them? I I don't know. I like I would totally 
point the finger at myself and saying, I assume that I assume that, you know what, it's a plant. It's good. It's gotta be good. Well, yeah, maybe they're not, I don't know. You know, so that, that brings me to the qu uh, question in the chat from Seth. Have you tried single species versus multiple species? No, uh, the closest single species would be Kyle's where, you know, it's, it, it was three species, but they're all in that brassica. Um, I, I think yeah, I'm not, I, I think I'm correct enough in saying that, you know, radishes, turnips, that was just that three species mix. So that would be like the, the most, the closest we'd have to like a monoculture of cover covers. Again, they're in that same category that didn't work either. Now, would it be different if it would have been like just, uh, sun hemp or safflower or flax? I, I don't know, May, you know, I don't know, but, but short answer is really no other than that one trial of Kyle's. Okay, and then another question, when you mowed, did you leave it lay or was it baled and removed? Uh, we left it, but the, those, the rotary mowers do an excellent job of, of uh, basically, you know, by day three, you can't even, you know, there's no real, it chops it up enough that that residue goes through. And again, when I, I got to make sure when we, when we talk about mowing, not I may have a little bit more mowing history than maybe most people on the call as to using mowing in restorations. Um, it's a very, very effective tool uh, applied appropriately. Like we mow only as low as we need to, to achieve the objective of topping off maybe the, the weed seed heads as necessary just to reduce competition. But we also can use mowing effectively on on native plantings and basically scalp that right down to the ground in year one, um, which we've done a, a ton of times. In fact, I've mowed I've mowed year one with a lawnmower and had a phenomenal establishment of natives. Does that mean they wouldn't have established without the mowing? Probably that's not true either. They probably would have, um, but you really can't get mowing wrong. It's more or less of is it really necessary? You know, like. And game fishing parks is very hands off among most of their mowing because they've got remote sites and they don't really have to. They're not really concerned necessarily with the aesthetics. The Carolyn X site we mowed again because we did have the. The lack of control from the chemicals on some of those spurge patches, uh, some of the wormwood. Now I'm not saying mowing will control spurge or wormwood, but it will knock it back enough that it's at least not putting more seed out there. And we're, you know, so we got noxious weed law and stuff like that, that we're trying to play that middle ground with, you know, control. So that's kind of the story on mowing. That's all the questions that we have thus far, and I don't see anybody else with their hand up. So are there any other questions for Pete? I would I would throw one out there uh, just in the context of a really heavy Kentucky bluegrass stand with a really heavy deaf duff layer. You know, I think there's quite a bit of success out there with going with, let's say, farming it for three years, maybe going like a soybean corn soybean. After three years, you're starting to break that duff layer down to the point where you can probably get it seeded. In any of the stuff that you're working on, are you seeing anything that can maybe speed that process of kind of that duff layer breaking down a little bit faster? Or? Well, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I have a great answer for that, but I'll go back to the first part of your question. Where you got Broman bluegrass, I think that we've learned enough over time to know that if you're going to use chemicals to break that cycle, you got to give it two or three years. It's just like there's too much investment on the back end not to kill that stuff out as dead as you can. I also think that we've learned a lot through our collectively through all of our agencies that if we're going to farm it, we also should be farming it for at least three. Years. Like, like, and, and this is, <clears throat> you know, this gets a little bit off track, but <clears throat> regardless of it's farming it out or spraying it out, can we collectively encourage USDA? And in this case, it's FSA. I know it's not an NRCS issue, but can we effectively encourage program expansion? You know, we're kind of on the verge of a, like a year of covers within a CRP program and those types of things. And this is where I don't want to throw the cover thing away at all. I don't care what the crop is. I just like the idea that we would ex expand on the back end, the ability for those grasslands to stay established 
while giving the producers a two or three year window minimum to prepare the seed bed appropriately for the establishment of those. We, I think we, we push a little too hard and it goes back to again, what you say, the breakdown of the residual, the impact of the chemicals on those, you know, on the, not only the bud bank, but the seed bank, et cetera, et cetera. So it all plays together. Um, I, I don't have a great answer for, but I, I'd also say that I'm not the only restorationist on this call. So if anybody's got a better answer, you know, I'd love to hear it um, for that question. I think that was a great answer because that was kind of a loaded question too. <laughs> it, it can be, right? Like, how do we work in what we know ecologically is good? I mean, hell, we could even we could we could just use the the burn date, the primary nesting date, as one of those exact examples. Like, we could do more better with to other tools uh, for some of this once we got the grass in the ground. Are we timing our management during the establishment phase well to avoid failure? And I think that's a whole nother topic, but you know, it, it, it's related, right? Like we build the house and then we kind of pull back the hammers and say, okay, we can't use our tools anymore because of a date. And then we, we don't, we don't have as good of a house as we could have built if we had really taken the handcuffs off and said, let's focus on establishment first and then we'll enjoy the you know the rewards of that establishment instead of having 15 years of questionable establishment you know a little off topic but it all comes back to that prep you know <clears throat> all right any follow-up questions or comments My only comment is I didn't get a chance to talk about the other site that we have, which is just kind of a playground of doing different things and working with some NRCS uh, staffers here out of Watertown and game and game fishing parks and um, Fenton's forever. And, you know, there may be, maybe we'll have a chance to, to have that kind of fun presentation and, you know, just these one-off goofy things that we're doing to always find a way to make, restoration easier and less expensive and so you know maybe we can maybe we can revisit that in the future but are you Pete are you going to have any any field type tours do you have anything lined up for this summer where we could get out get some <laughs> of our staff out and look at some of these sites or do you have any plans for that we have plans for it. we don't have dates on the calendar okay. yet i've got to get kind of our core team together uh you know obviously we're going to be well i guess i'll use this as a plug we're going to be doing redoing the East River Grazing School again this year, and we will be doing these site tours as part of the Grassland Management School. I'm anticipating um, August. Uh, I okay. think the reason is I think that by that time we generally we're going to have flowering plants up and going. It's just a, a more informative um, tour. So kind of look at August, you know, as maybe the that time period for site tours. And, uh, okay, sounds great. Well, yeah, if you want to get me that information, we'll get it out to our staff and partners. Okay. So that'd be great. <clears throat> well, thank you all. I know it was, I know there's a lot there, but appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Pete. We appreciate it. And uh, yeah, if you've got more to present, um, this is uh, our second to last technical training Thursday for the the year. We kind of shut them down in the spring and summer just because we know everybody's out in the field. So we'll pick them back up in October. So Pete, if you've got more information to present, we'd love to have you have you back again um, next fall or, or next spring. So thanks everybody. Take care. Enjoy the beautiful day. Thank you.